<laughs> Welcome everybody to Trad Man. This is our first. This is the first episode that's also going to be on YouTube, right? Uh, so you know, if you were expecting uh, some better looking hosts, we are very sorry about that. But we never claimed. Look, I never claimed that you were going to be uh, uh, dazzled by this, but it is what it is. Hopefully, we don't lose viewers. We're very comely. <laughs> um today's episode is going to be about a a trend that's going on that's going on 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 everybody's youtube channel and on everybody's podcast and in every on on all throughout catholic internet media and uh we're it's this it's it's this trend of is pope francis really the pope is the catholic church still the true church do we all need to jump ship and go to Constantinople? And we're going to get into that, and you're going to get our our view. But the first thing we should do is uh, is pray. You ready, Jace? I'm ready. In omni patris et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. Vini sancti spiritus. Repletor da corda fidelium et tui amoris in eis ignim acende. Imite spiritum tuum et creabuntur. Et renovabis facem tere. Oremos. Deus qui corda fidelium, sancti spiritus, illustrazione docuisti. Da nobis in iorum spiritu recta sapere, et de eo semper consolazione gadere, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Jace, is the Pope, did the Pope excommunicate himself? Did the Pope excommunicate himself? <laughs> is that even possible? And do, and... And do I have the power, do I have the authority to excommunicate the Pope here on my YouTube channel? No, I would, I would, I mean, I'm kind of venturing out on a limb here, but I would say you do not have that power. And hmm. the question is, who does have the power? Well, according to the Code of Canon Law, nobody. Uh, and there's a thing going on, and, you know, everybody's aware of, of Pope Francis said something in a homily, or he was giving a talk, or, a, or something like that. Maybe it was an Angelus. I don't. Know. I, I think it was the Angelus. Yeah, that was just naked heresy. It was an. It was an. It was in total error from the a theological truth that the Church teaches. So now everybody's like, well, if Vatican I says that the Pope can't teach in error on matters of faith and morals, and he just did that. He must have abdicated his position, and are are we? What do we make of all that? And who, you know, everybody's in out in space with all this right now. I figured it'd be a good topic to weigh in on, and you know, get yeah. what I believe is our perspective. Now, you you may have a different take on it than I do because we you know, we're two different people. So, uh, but. M m Correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, your position here is that Francis is still the Pope and any claim otherwise um, is is in error and is wrong to do that because uh, we're, we're, we're spreading scandal and we're uh, we're sowing we're, we're making the problem worse, basically. Yeah, no, definitely. If I, I'm not a set of a contest. I do not espouse that viewpoint, nor do I support it. And I'm not, uh, what what are they called, a uh, Benevacantus? Still believe that Pope uh, Emeritus Benedict is still the valid Pope. Like, uh, I believe Is that what that's called? Okay, I didn't know that <laughs> had a name. Yeah, if it wasn't, I just made it up then. But no, I, I, I basically uh, <laughs> Interesting. read it somewhere online. But yeah, I mean, there was a popular um, Catholic apologist, media pundit, whatever you want to call him, that's come out this week and made a video talking about how Pope Benedict is still... The Pope, I mean, I, I don't really want to get into the details of all that because there's plenty of other uh, Catholic podcasters who've gotten into uh, more detail on that that would do it better justice than I could. But, no, I, d despite the shortcomings of Pope Francis, I still um, believe he is the the Pope of the Catholic Church. He is still the Holy Father. That's interesting you talk about despite his deficiencies or things you don't like about him or anything like that, because I feel like a big chunk of this problem is about people having a very um, unrealistic expectation of what the Pope is, what his office, because we know that his office is protected by a certain charism. 
from the Holy Spirit that protects it from from error, but in very specific, narrow circumstances. And and what those narrow circumstances are is not exactly, um, I think, widely known to by the average layperson. When I was growing up in the Catholic Church, I was taught the Pope, when the Pope speaks on matters of faith and morals, he enjoys the charism of infallibility. Incorrect. Incorrect theological statement. I grew up my whole life thinking that. And then I was... In a religious house of formation, you know, I spent two years as a novice in a, in a religious house of formation, discerning a vocation. And I finally read something that troubled me. I read an official statement from a pope, not a recent pope, that I knew to be in error. So obviously my understanding was was not correct. Um, what did it I th- have? Did, did, did it throw you? back quite a bit or did it did it knock you down some or did you just kind of roll with it what what happened with you when you well, ran I knew, across that immediately my mind went to uh, the understanding is probably the misunderstanding is probably mine because that's always been the case when things like this happen and sure enough you get you go to a priest you go to you know your spiritual director your theology professor whoever and you explain Hey, I thought this, this, or this, and then you get cleared up. Um, It is not true that when every time the the Bishop of Rome speaks on matters of faith and moral, he enjoys infallibility. That is not what the First Vatican Council says. What they said in the final session um, just states, I'll just read it real quick. So then, if anyone says that the Roman pontiff has merely an office of supervision and guidance and not the full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the whole church, and that not only in matters of faith and morals, but also those which concern uh, the government, uh, no, that, that's not, did I read the wrong thing? Yeah, I, read, I just sat here and read the wrong thing. Uh, here it is. Well, see, this is this is now I got how it. much how supportive I am of you. I just sit you lay here and read it. You know, I'm just like you know, I don't I don't know where this Thank is you, going, but I'm gonna trust. Mark. Okay, here it is. We teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman Pontiff speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church he possesses. By the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, that infallibility which the divine redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church irreformable. We just lost Jason. (laughs) We just lost Jason. Oh, that was a good, good time too. Let's get him back. I can tell he's, he's calling back in. Sit tight folks. This guy's a trooper. He's coming back. I know he's coming back. There he is. I don't know why. Why, why it did that last time and this time too? I don't know why it does that. So, we're so very short paragraph. I'm just going to read it to you again. Okay. We teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman Pontiff speaks ex cathedra, that is when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority. He defines a doctrine concerning faith and morals to be held by the whole church. He possesses by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, that infallibility, which the divine redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith and morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church irreformable. So he's got to be defining a doctrine of faith and morals. This is something that has to be published like, like, look at uh, uh, Mediator Dei or Inefabilis, uh, the, the, the one that teaches the Immaculate Conception. That's a whole mm. encyclical yeah. with not just explaining today, from here on out, we teach as dogma, the Blessed Virgin Mary was the Immaculate Conception. It explains what that means and defines that it's a dogma to be held by the whole Catholic Church. And it's not something that... It, just thinking off the top of my head, I can't think of one. Like if you talk about the Assumption of Mary, 
it was defined as dogma, but at that point in time, but it was something that was already widely believed right. by by Christians well before the the dogmatic declaration was made. Um, so yeah, I mean, like the other day when when Pope Francis was talking about the communion of saints and all that. The, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he also has to have the intention of teaching something on faith and morals, which I don't know that the communion of the saints, well, well, I shouldn't say I don't know. I don't think his Angelus talk on the communion of the saints had anything to do it uh, with, it, it with defining, defining something dogmatic. So um, can the Pope err in his homilies in his talks in his interviews yes and this is nothing new to pope francis i mean it's it's nothing new uh uh post-vatican to you know the, the, the it's you, nothing you new about to the papacy popes, yeah i mean pre-vatican too popes were you know there was times where they would say things incorrectly now you kind of get into the whole is it formal or material did they know did they intentionally do it I don't. Th- none of that really matters the, the, it, it, for what we're talking about. I mean, what they've done, uh, or what Pope Francis has said, even in error, is nothing wrong. And, and past popes haven't lost their uh, their office because of that. And we were talking yesterday just about the evils of some of the past popes. Um, I believe you were talking about Pope. Al- uh, what was his name? Alexander the Alexander the sixth. Six. Just just the evil of his person as a whole. As far as I know, he's still considered in the line of succession. Oh yeah, most definitely. And uh, there's no. Let me so so let me give you an example of a time when a pope, not just in a speech, but in a written document and a very important written document, spoke on a matter of faith and morals. And then actually in the document said that anybody who doesn't believe this is anathema and in, in, and incorrect. And he was still wrong. And I'll, I'll share this with you. Yeah, go it was ahead. A little, it was a little papal bull called Exurge Domine, written by Pope Leo X in the year 1520, written to address certain theological arguments being made by a rambunctious young German monk who ended up causing a lot of problems. This is the letter written to Martin Luther telling him you're out of pocket. And if you don't stop your bull crap, we're going to excommunicate you out of the Catholic church. It is worded very strongly, but it's also got some things that he defines as errors that if you believe that they're true, you are in error. And I'll give you a perfect example. He writes in virtue of our pastoral office committed to us by the divine favor, we can under no circumstances tolerate or overlook any longer the pernicious poison of the above errors without disgrace to the Christian religion and injury to Orthodox faith. Some of these errors we have decided to include in the present document. Their substance is as follows. He's got a list of things, but number 33 is interesting to me. That heretics be burned is against the will of the spirit. So here we have a Pope stating that if you're somebody who believes that that rounding up Jews, Muslims, and Protestants and lighting them on fire would be an incorrect thing to do, this Pope says you're in error. He doesn't just say that. He finishes off down here with no one of sound mind is ignorant how destructive, pernicious, and scandalous, and seductive to pious and simple minds these various errors are. Uh he goes on to say that, you know, if you're somebody who holds these views, you are anathema and in error and uh, heretical and all this that and the other thing. That's an error. It is, it, is, it is, in fact, against the will of the Holy Spirit that we burn heretics. Christ did not want us to kill sinners. He wanted sinners to repent. So that's 1520. Leo the Tenth, not exactly a modernist. This has happened before. <laughs> Everybody, well, let, just calm down. <laughs> let, let me ask you this, because you bring up an interesting point about burning heretics. And previously, I'd always been like, you know, thought, okay, there's no justification of it, right? Right. Then I heard, and I'm not saying I advocate for this, but ju- just for sake of discussion, I heard, you know, the idea that, um. 
the idea of at least burning heretics that were that are Catholic and then became heretics afterwards. Apostates. It, apostates. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, the idea was, you know, of justice. So when we have put people to death in the past, one of the justifications was it was justice, right? Because you didn't, and for the common good, because you didn't want them to go out and physically harm and kill other people, right? You were, you're trying right. to protect society. The argument was, what greater harm can you cause to somebody besides their physical? It's their spiritual. So when the church used to, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say advocate, that's not the right word, but but when heretics yeah. used to be burned or killed or whatever the case may be, however however they died, the idea was it was for it was to protect the common good because heretics would lead people's spiritual souls into damnation. So that was the justification on that. And again, I'm not saying that we 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 bring that practice back up, but I but I believe even Saint Thomas Aquinas was in favor of burning or not. You, you got oh, me saying I have burning. No, I have no I, doubt. I, I, I mean, I don't mean burning. Like I'm uh, putting to death. Like like sure. heresy is you know in, in some cases. Sure. Should you can justify with it by death. by death. Yeah, you've got burn in my head here now. But here's, uh, here's here's the challenge with that. Okay, what we understand what the Catholic Church teaches in her official teaching, in her catechesis, in her magisterium, is that human nature is in because it's because it's been elevated to a dignity above even the angels by virtue of our Lord's incarnation. Doing. Taking away and intentionally taking a human life can only morally, licitly be done under very extreme, horrible circumstances like self-defense or defense of another innocent person. And there's no and there's no other way to stop this guy from hurting people other than to <laughs> take him out right now. And even then, it says if you take him out, you've done so morally. But it's still grave matter. It's not. A, it may not be a mortal sin, depending on the circumstances. But the taking of a human life is grave matter. So, and there's also a, an issue in there of we have to respect people's freedom. We don't say that you have the right to be a heretic, but you certainly do have the freedom. God gave you the freedom to either accept Him or reject Him. And if and if God gives a person that freedom, we do not have the authority to legally take that freedom away from a person and force them into our religion because a, in order to, to be, be a member of the religion, you have to receive the sacraments. And one of the requirements of that is you have to intend. Right. To, yeah. I mean, we can't go church. out. We can't go out and just start grabbing people up right. and just dunking them in water. Right. What what document of Vatican II was it that talked about religious freedom? Because I know it was very controversial. Oh, uh, 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 yeah, uh, among uh, certain groups. Unitatis Redensa Gratio, um, and well, actually, that was the no, one on no, the non-Christian that, religions. Yeah, but, no, no, it's a. Uh, hang on one second, I can tell. Yeah, you. let me see if I can find it here because well, while you look for it, I know that you know this idea um, of religious freedom. Uh, Pull the muscle in my back from stretching. <laughs> Typically, you know, you'll come across traditional Catholics who will say the church has taught against the the uh, religious freedom, right? The, the the right to choose your own religion in, in a way, I guess. But anyway, but I think what this what the document of Vatican II is mainly talking about is it's not saying that you're OK if you pick a different religion. You have that right and you'll be fine. It's saying you have the way I read it, you have the right to choose you have the freedom to choose but that does not absolve you of the consequences of choosing a false religion now or in the afterlife um that's that's that exactly it and the, the the document that talks about uh declar De declaration on religious liberty is the word that they use not religious freedom um is actually called dignitatis humanis the dignity the human dignity it, it it deals right with that let me see. Um, I think I think there was another another because that doesn't sound right. Let me look while you go ahead. No, and, that's uh, Declaration on Religious Liberty, Vatican II, human, uh, Dignitatis um, Humanae. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. That's it. Uh, but yeah, I know a lot of that. That document is used to say that you know Vatican II taught heresy, but I don't. 
I don't think it did. I think it's taken out of context personally from what from the way I understand it when I read it. Um, but well, anybody who would say that, my question to them would be is, okay, well, if that's a heresy, then how many heretics did you burn? Because if you haven't done it, and that's the right thing to do, you're in trouble. Now, my guess would be that none of these so-called Catholic bloggers and podcasters who are holier than the church, they've probably never killed anybody because they know darn good and well that that is not acceptable behavior, that you would be in grave mortal sin, not to mention probably going to prison for the rest of your life, if not executed on death row. So they know they know that that's a facile argument and, and that's ridiculous. I mean, who? Please, please. Uh, that's not even sincere, I don't think, from what people. Uh, but going back to my point. But I mean, you can't you can't, <clears throat> you know, the idea is if the way I, I, I read that document, you know, I explained it a minute ago. But the, the, the reverse side of that, the people that are against it, it's like you can't force you can't go through mass conversion through force, right? I mean, right. that's that's what other some other religions do. That's that's what that's what people do that really don't care about about the conversion of your heart. They just want compliance, right? Because right. then at the end of the day, what's important is your heart, right? Jesus Jesus repeatedly talks about and teaches us that that the what you hold in your heart is what's important, right? Not not the compliance of oh, I'm going through the motions. I I go to mass every week. I I receive holy Eucharist. I go to confession regularly. Don't get me wrong. All great things and things that you need to do in order to to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? Those are things that are going to help you along the, uh, this road, or as Paul calls it, the race, right? The, the, they're going to help you win the race. However, going through the motions doesn't do any good. I mean, Paul even talks about in his letter to the Corinthians, you can do all these wonderful, great things. You can you can heal the sick. You can heal the blind. You can do, you know, prophesy and do all these things. But if you don't do it with love, it doesn't matter. And, well, I mean, what, and, what did Christ say in the Gospels? God does not desire the death of a sinner. He desires that he should repent. I forget exactly what the quote is, but, uh, you know, bottom line is, in the natural law written into the human heart, you know that burning people <laughs> is um, not something you'd want to do or, or should do. I think you know that. And But now at the time that he's writing this, it's a completely normal uh, and acceptable form of adjudicating a crime, the crime of heresy. But it is, it is against the will of the Holy Spirit that we burn people. And I don't well, care that it was. I don't care that it was in fashion in 1520. We, it's against the will of the Holy Spirit to set people on fire. Well, I will say this before, since I brought this whole topic up, before people say, I uh, I support burning heretics. Actually, I prefer the route of <laughs> let's give the sinner time to repent. <laughs> you know, and if he and if he doesn't get the charcoals, uh, <laughs> no, I, you know. But my point is, is that popes. You know, it's not like uh, you get some sort of protective hedge around you when you become the Bishop of Rome that you just can't sin anymore. I mean, if that were the case, <laughs> then every pope throughout history would have been would be a saint. And there's a lot of people who like the guy that I like, who I think ought to be pope is Robert Cardinal Seurat. That's my if I had to pick a pope, that would be the guy I'd pick. And I think a lot of tradition, traditional Latin mass lovers would agree with that. But here's the deal. Let me, let me just blow your mind right now. Robert Cardinal Seurat is a sinner. He has an unnatural attraction to evil. He, uh, he, he, has, he has all the same predilections and insecurities and fears that you do. Now, I'd like to think that in a lifetime of spiritual growth that he has pursued that he might be a holier person than me but what if he's just what if it's all just an outward appearance i don't know that and i don't get to judge him on the last day to find out one way or the other so you know the, the idea that oh i wish we had a different pope so for what reason so that we'll get the one that doesn't commit any sins or doesn't make any mistakes or doesn't screw anything up 
Yeah. And if you can only be a member of a church where the leader of the church that's on earth uh, is a perfect person, you're going to be looking for a, a congregation to belong to for a long time. Well, I mean, who was who the only person that God, um, through his grace, uh, basically took away their unholy attraction to to sin? The Blessed Virgin Mary. Right. And, you know, I heard this. I heard this story, and I and I, I don't think I've said it on the podcast, but I sent it to you in a text, and it goes along with what you're saying. If you know that at the end of the day, the me, you, every everybody else, we're, we're going to let let each other down at some point, right? Our 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 religious leaders are going to let us down at some point because they're they have a fallen nature, right? And just, like you said, just because you're you become the pope doesn't mean you all of a sudden lose your fallen nature, right? There was a, <clears throat> I heard this story about a Puritan uh, minister when he, when he, when the Puritans came over to the Americas, he re, he made up his mind that he could not pray with anybody that didn't believe the way that he believed. Right. So mm -hmm. his, his group got small and, and, and I'm not talking about like, you know, we say as Catholics, we shouldn't necessarily pray with with other groups who 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 are apostates or who are in uh, in error and stuff like that, right? Like as a as a whole. I mean, that's not what this guy is saying. This guy is saying that if you don't line up with everything that I view, and I'm and I'm not talking about like dogmatic issues like that. Like he's, uh, I'm kind of rambling here. You're, you're talking but, about virtue. He's got to be. You have to be just yes. as virtuous as I am. Exactly. As I think so, I am anyway. So, so, and, and even, even in Catholicism, there's a lot of areas that we have freedom to explore, to choose. Right. Sure. Um, but anyway, I, I'm kind of rambling here. I digress, but anyway, he, he wouldn't pray with anybody that, um, didn't believe exactly like he did. Well, all of a sudden, this circle became smaller, and it got to the point where he could only pray with his family. Well, then he found out that even his family wasn't virtuous like he thought they should be. So then he was praying by himself. He comes to find out, I'm falling too. I'm not that virtuous. I'm not even meeting the standards that I've set. So he got to the point where he didn't even pray at all. And the point of the story is that's that's where this idea is that it's holier than thou that, you know, I hold everybody to this unattainable standard. Eventually you're going to fall out of prayer and out of step yourself. Oh no, no question. In fact, what, one of the things that I've noticed about myself is when I get the most mad at the Catholic church for not being the immaculate and wonderful institution that it would be if only I could run it. What's really happening is, I am angry at myself about um, a certain sin I've committed or a certain moral fault that I know that I have. And I don't want to look at that and admit that I don't want to go to confession. So the reason I don't go to confession is the Catholic church isn't good enough. That's what it is. You know, and, I, when, and then you do that for a couple of weeks and then you realize yeah, it was you. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> You brought this on yourself kind of a thing, you know, yeah. I, I find that is now I'm not saying that's the deal with everybody, but there's certain people out there. They're excommunicating popes and bishops on their podcasts and, uh, the, you know, the, the Twitter verses awash with everybody who claims Francis isn't the real pope because, you know, he, he's not a good enough guy or something like that. Here's the deal. Um, you may not like Francis individually as a human being or just as a person. If I knew him, I wouldn't go have a beer with him. Okay, I'll accept that. That's fine. You may think he's not a particularly good pope. Also fair. I personally really only have one major beef with Francis, and that's Traditionis Custodes and what has come after. All the other things that everybody seems to really dislike about him the note in amoris laetitia that caused the dubia well that ha that portion of that note was in a an appendix to the document if i'm not mistaken and it was responding to uh to bishops who want to you know how bishops should treat divorced and remarried catholics i am not a bishop i am not a divorced and remarried catholic 
so it didn't really have anything to do with me. And I'm not saying so. So thus, I'm not really in a position where I can judge the theological quality of what he said or what he didn't say. The Cardinals who wrote the dubia, they are in a much better position to have that discussion with the Holy Father. And I believe they have every right to have that discussion with the Holy Father. And I, uh, I, I wish he would have answered that dubia because I think it was, um, you know, they were well within their rights to, to write that. But other than that, you know, it's a hard job. It is a hard job. You know, I, I I guarantee you not a person out here would want to be the Pope. They There might be people who claim that they would want that, but you don't want that. Um, it's it's a hard job. You know, and, and one of my, if anybody's listened to this podcast, and I'm the last one to to say anything about this because I can be the most stuttering, unclear person. I mean, you just saw that five minutes ago, me trying to tell this Puritan story, right? So I, <laughs> I'm the last person to uh, to complain about this. I'm 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 number one at it, right? I have an interesting but, joke about the Puritans when when you're done. <laughs> so, but when we when we get on here, and I guess that's why sometimes I kind of hesitate and stumble because. I want to be careful with what I say and how I say it. Cause right. Sometimes things come formulate up here and they come out in a different way. And I don't, at the end of the day, I don't want to call scandal. And as we've said on here many times at the end of the day, go with the magisterium of the church. If I, I'm going to be wrong at times, I, I'm telling you, if we do enough of these podcasts, I probably already have been, but if I'm, I, I'm going to be wrong at some point, but you know, with 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 some of the things I've been reading online and, and everything, it's not that I have an issue with these people calling out what they view as the error of Pope Francis or others in, the, others in the hierarchy, right? Because I firmly believe in doing that when it happens. And me and you have been critics on here of many things of the hierarchy, including Pope Francis, right? But you have to be careful what you say and where you lead people because – me and you were talking about this last night. James Martin is really good about promoting a message without actually saying it so that he has the liability later when it comes up. And recently with, 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 a, with a podcaster, I actually don't have any major qualms with the guy. To be honest with you, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have found the fraternity, the traditional Latin mass when when I did, if ever, right? So I, I have no major, what I did have problems with, not that he was calling out error, but when you read, when you're reading tweet after tweet after tweet, and one and one tweet says, you know, just because you wear white doesn't mean you're Catholic. Another tweet says, um, you know, it, it's quoting a saint that says, if a Pope teaches heresy, he automatically is no longer Pope. Next tweet is Pope Francis teaches heresy. You know, so on and so forth. Okay, well, you haven't really said that you believe the the seat is empty, the seat is vacant, right? But can't you at least see how people misconstrue that message? And that was, I, I try not to engage with these type of things too much. I mean, I'm not the best at avoiding confrontation sometimes, but that was my whole message is great. I don't have a problem with your message about, hey, this is wrong what you're saying or you need to clarify it. But what you need to clarify is, hey, I, I believe Pope or Pope Francis is still the Pope. I don't believe anybody else is or the seat is vacant. Now, they did come out with a video recently clarifying this. Great. I, I, I Personally, I appreciate it, right? But in, but in the very beginning, don't, don't discredit people by saying, oh, he's just quoting saints. He's just doing this. He's just doing that. Because... You're, you're intentional or unintentional. You're sending a message that can be detrimental to some people, because as I found out, <laughs> Twitter and especially traditional Catholic Twitter can be very toxic and people are looking for anything to latch on to that, that, you know, that they may already have this feeling of, man, I'm just looking to jump on, on Pope Francis, right? You, right. you, you seem to have two sides of the coin. You have, I, I, I heard one, fellow podcaster mentioned what he called the hermeneutic of suspicion, 
where everything Pope Francis does is wrong. Like no matter what he says, no just matter because, what he does. Just because he's Pope Francis. Like like today, I sent you that message of somebody saying, you know, I guess Pope Francis had mentioned about Jesus being our brother and whatnot. And there were some people saying, well, he's not our brother. He's God, you heretic Freemason and blah, blah, blah. I just... To, to one of them, I responded with St. Maximilian Kobe. His quote, I said, I, I, I'm not debating, uh, what's that document he wrote uh, about the brotherhood? Um, for, uh, for Tutti? Oh, oh, Fratelli Tutti? Yeah, that. So, you and know. I like I, Fratelli Tutti. It's one of my favorite things that he's ever written. Well, as I said on there, well, as I said on, on, on Twitter, I, I haven't read the document, so I don't, I can't argue one way or another about it, right? But what I can say is, how do you if if you're saying because you're jumping on Pope Francis because he says Jesus is our brother, well, for one, you have scripture where Jesus talks about all those that follow follow me are my mother, my brother, my sister, right? And then two, I asked him, how do you view this quote by Saint Maximilian Kobe? And in all honesty and all charity, it was a sincere question. How do you view this where he says? Anyone that wishes to have Jesus as their brother uh, needs to have Mary as their mother or, or something. Here, I can look it up and I'll read it to you real quick. I've got it right here. Um, let's see. So what it says, if anyone does not wish to have Mary Immaculate for his mother, he will not have Christ for his brother. And I don't think St. Maximilian Kobe was a modernist Freemason. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the founder so, of the militia Immaculata. No, probably not a Freemason. But I do appreciate the person's response. I thought it was, you know, so sometimes we get in this. You, you run across people. I may be guilty of myself at times where you try to refute something which you really don't know. But they just had no idea. They they didn't know how to to respond to that, right? Because right. because in in this quote, Saint Maximilian Kobe is saying that we can have Jesus as our brother if we have Mary, the Virgin Mary, as our mother. So anyway, but, 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 you, but you've got that where people jump on everything that he does, and it's always wrong. Then you have the flip side where he can do no wrong. And both sides actually, and I'm talking about Pope Francis, like does no wrong. And both sides really kind of irritate me in the same way that it irritates me, like here in America today with all the racial division and stuff that we have. You know, every... You have two groups of people, you know, and, and not even necessarily based on race, but just ideology. You, anytime there's a there's a white cop and a black victim in a shooting, right? There's one side that always says the cop is wrong. There's one side that always says the cop is right, right? No matter what the situation is, and I'm and I'm kind of like I've always been like, can't we just take them on a case by case basis and judge? Yeah, because reality of each? is always somewhere in the middle, usually. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I kind of feel with Pope Francis. Can't we just, instead of jumping on it right away, let's look at it in in charity. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt as best we can. And I'm by no means am I saying, do we need to support error or maybe heresy or whatever the word is that you want to use. But let's find that, that reasoned, centered ground where we where we are able to to find a, a what am i trying to say? try to find a path forward as we grow in our spiritual life instead of always you know budding heads um this one the, the one podcast i was talking about earlier that i got that i talked about he has a thing where he says unite the clans love it let's unite the clans you know talking about you know uh, all the different groups of traditionalists come on but and people tend today, I've noticed, like I can argue with somebody, I can get in a heated argument, like a really heated argument. And afterwards, I can still talk to you. I'm, I don't hate you because we disagreed vehemently on something. But a lot of people seem to not be able to do that. And it's like, even within traditional Catholics, it's like bang, bang, bang against each other. And, uh, but anyway, I, I'm kind of going on here, but I think you get my point. Like, let's, Let's just look at at what what Pope Francis says and not just jump on him every time. You you know you know what I'm saying, but it, on the flip side, don't let him get away with error. So the the, the joke I want to tell you about the Puritans, um, 
this is attributed to Winston Churchill, although I don't know if he really said it or not, but um, they were talking about the, the anniversary of, you know, Oliver Cromwell started in the English Civil War and killed King Charles the first and uh and then and then ruled England in his stead or whatever. And uh Winston Churchill was commenting on Thanksgiving, I think, and he said the Americans have a holiday to commemorate when all the Puritans went to America. We in England ought to have a holiday to commemorate the fact that they left. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. Um Yeah. There's a there's a thing and you know, going back to what you were talking about with the Pope. Part of this, I believe, is a manifestation or a symptom of an overall irreligious society that na- that because we've eliminated religion pretty much from our, I mean, it's entirely out of our public sphere. And what exists in private is like, a, you know, we talked about how crappy American religion is. I mean, you know, they've reduced Christianity to a marketing scheme for the most part. Uh, and all the, you know, Buddhism is about stretching and, you know, tight fitting yoga pants and, and people just have this, any religion you want to mention, people have a, this, this, this watered down insepid version of it that is just good for nothing. And then you notice those same people, they're all, they're all about going to Lakewood church until a family member dies. Because when real life comes back, when death as a punishment for sin, and it's a horrible punishment, death will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, don't forget about me. I'm still real. They quit going to Lakewood after that because Lakewood really doesn't have anything to say about the the existential crisis of the human condition. Um, so, and the, this is what's happened. And I've noticed that there's a thing out there where we've now started to worship human beings as the new religion. You know, Donald Trump, how, you know, whether you voted for him or whether you didn't vote for him, the one thing that I've always found creepy are the people who their whole identity is tied up in Donald Trump. I saw this also with Barack Obama. You know, they're. They talked about him like he was Jesus. And I thought, what's he done to deserve to deserve that much adulation? Um, and the fact of the matter is, because we got rid of Jesus, we shoveled him off, we've now decided to replace him with idols. Pope Francis having to be perfect and having to be your model of holiness or he's got to go. That's happening because you forgot your model of holiness was Christ. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the guy that we're supposed to be worshiping in this religion. Oh, man. And I'm telling you, if you just keep your eye on Christ, that's your model of holiness. You know, pray your rosary. And if your mask got taken away from you, I feel really bad. That, that, that angers me and it makes me very upset. Here's what you do. Go to the Novus Ordo. For, for fulfill your Sunday obligation, go home, get on the get on YouTube and watch a traditional Latin mass and attend it the best way you can. If you still got a traditional Latin mass in your parish, attend it, support it. Um, you know, and there's nothing that nothing that frustrates me more than people who are just so angry at what Pope Francis did to the Latin mass, and then oh yeah, I skipped last Sunday. Well, like, just bro. I mean, I mean, there's 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 plenty of saints in the two thousand year history, right? Who conditions necessarily weren't favorable favorable for them, but they found a way to to still live a holy life. Find us, you know. I, I would say find a saint that you can relate with that was in the same maybe you viewed the same situation as yourself and emulate their example. And in terms of, you don't need to be scandalized. Okay, the Catholic. Uh, th- there's another thing amongst traditional Latin Mass lovers where we, we've we've got this idea because I was born in 1978, uh, so w- very few Dude, of us. You were... are so much older than me. Oh man, I'm ancient. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I was. You're what? What year were you born? 78. You're four years old. 78. There's a hey. There's a lot in that those four years, youngster. <laughs> yeah. Just don't. A lot you of forget. knowledge. Um, 
Well, that's why never, you're the brains having... of this operation, right? <laughs> we hope not. Um, <laughs> I, I, we, I was never alive in the in the preconciliar Catholic Church, so there's this myth that exists that before 1962. Nothing bad ever happened in the Catholic Church. Everything, the Catholic Church just operated like an efficient machine of of holiness. Everybody was a saint. There were no modernists, which is weird because the Pope wrote an encyclical against modernism in 1907. Do you think he did that because there weren't any modernists in the church? The Catholic Church for 2,000 years has always been a hot mess. And it, and it, and and let me tell you something, unless the second coming happens before this, two or 3,000 years later, it will be just as ridiculous. And in spite of all of it, it survives. Think of it that way. You know, I mean, it, there, it, there was like a two or 300 year gap between the beginning of what we call the Dark Ages and, and the Council of Trent. Imagine trying to be a Catholic for 200 years where your bishop has got four or five families and different dioceses and, you know, he's father siring all these kids and taking all your money. And, and if, and you know, what, what would you do if at the next conclave, Blaise Supich becomes the Pope? And what are you going to do? If he holds a same sex wedding right there in St. Peter's Basilica, because I got to tell you, it would not be the craziest thing a Pope has done in St. Peter's Basilica. Alexander the sixth, who you just mentioned earlier, held orgies in the church, in the, in the St. Peter's Basilica. I read a, a book about his exploits. I had to put the book down because I said, if I keep reading this, I'm going to have to go to confession. The most depraved, debauchery you can imagine he did it right there in st peter's basilica above the tomb of peter himself this ain't nothing new keep the faith you don't need to be scandalized you know what the true teaching of the catholic church is you got a catechism so when pope says something that don't seem right go back and look at the catechism and if the if the catechism says something different go with the catechism you know this is not a difficult I, like I say, I don't think there is a crisis, and I don't think there's any confusion. I don't think anybody here is confused. Everybody here knows exact. The modernists know exactly what they're doing, and we know exactly what they're doing, too. There's no confusion. Just calm down. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> That's basically my take on all this. But Yeah, well, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we don't necessarily follow the Pope. I mean, he's our... You know he's our, 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 our the leader of the church, but we on earth, on earth, on earth. But but ultimately, who is our guide? Who is our our leader? Jesus Christ, right? And that is that is he is the head of the church. We follow him. We will never. He will never let us down. Pope Francis will let us down. Your dream pope will let you down at some point in this pontificate if it goes oh, on for long sure. Enough. If it goes on long enough, unless he has a one or two month reign, he is going to let you down. I don't care who it is. And, you know, all these set of accountants who who claim, you know, of course, there's a variance on who the last pope was. But but it seems like a majority of them view uh, Pope Pius the 12th. I read some things that he wrote that I was like, I can't believe set of accountants are OK with this. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, there were things that he wrote that that I'm like, I, I I don't necessarily know about that. And there are things that I hear people criticize the post conciliar popes for that he was kind of kind of writing about that. You could say I could see where they got, you know, that that he was kind of starting to spur this idea. I should have looked it up beforehand. I I didn't even think about it. So why would I do that? But uh, but I remember reading something when we were looking at. Uh, what was it, the Assumption episode or whatever? And I remember reading mm -hmm. something by him, and I was like, that that don't sound right. You know, somebody told me a long time ago, a person who loves me told me, if you want, I'm going to give you the secret to a happy life. Don't take things personally. 
Yeah. If you read Traditionis Custodes, and I did, I read Traditionis Custodes like this was written to me. He wrote that to Mark Robertson, and he did it on purpose. And he thinks that I'm, uh, I, I think I'm the one, I'm the only true church, and I'm, I'm conceited and all this, that, and the other thing. He doesn't, he just lied about me. He can't say that thing. Maybe he wasn't talking about you. Because we can all admit there are some people who go to some of these traditional Latin mass churches who could stand to be taken down a few pegs. Okay. And maybe just maybe he wasn't talking about you. I mean, let's go there. And man, I'm the first one who, who, you know, I wanted to, uh, it would be so convenient to just out of, in a thought, excommunicate the Pope. He's not really the Pope anymore. And I think, but if you're only going to follow the church when she happens to do the things that you already like or you understand or that you – then you're not really being obedient at all. You just happen to be walking in the same direction at one particular time. Yeah. And, you know, the, somebody – don't take things personally. Stick, stick, stick to – I, I got to tell you, I don't even pay attention to the news about Francis anymore. I mean, unless it's got something directly to do with me, I just sort of, you know, I, I turn off Catholic media, except for this show, still listen to Tradman, um, and focus on your spiritual life. Put it to you this way. If you're upset and like really enraged about Francis and really, you know, I would like you to keep a diary of your daily spiritual life. Did you get in all your, your prayers that day? Did you pray your rosary? Did you pray before meals? Did you commit any mortal sins that day? When you, uh, did you act honorably in all of your business dealings? Did you, did you pay your workers, your employees a fair and living wage that day? Go through a good examination of conscience at the end of every day and look and see how you did. And if you're not, as perfect as you demand Francis be button it a little, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that you can't criticize when he does something that's legitimately bad. And I, I think Traditionis Custodes was a big mistake. I don't understand what the wisdom of that was, but, um, you know, I, it's nothing I can do about it. The college of Cardinals doesn't, call and ask me, hey, Mark, we're at this Amazon Synod. Uh, we're thinking about uh, getting rid of priestly celibacy, and uh, we're all in this room, and we want you to weigh in. Doesn't happen. Has never happened. And I got news for you. It ain't ever gonna. So move on, you know. Uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, I'm kind of over Traditionis Custodes because he can't kill the mass. That cat's out of the bag. And uh, all attempts to do otherwise are going to end in failure. And I don't have to do anything to cause that. It's going to do it all on its own. W look back at our modernism episode. This is not a movement that has a single success story that they can point to and say, we did that. And the church wouldn't even have this if it weren't for us. And we can show anybody who has a problem with modernism. Hey, yeah, but look at this. You have to give us credit for that. They don't have a single one of those things that they can do that to. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. Don't worship people. Worship Jesus Christ, who was a person. But, you know, who is a person, yeah. I should say. That. <laughs> See that? I just committed heresy. Get the logs. Get the kerosene. I excommunicate you, Mark. Here we go. You know, Jason, I've been thinking, um, you made a, a, a flat earth joke on the last podcast. And for that, I'm going to formally excommunicate you too. I cast you out into the outer regions with the devil and all his fallen angels to the realm of everlasting pain. Uh, you're kind of scaring me now. <laughs> so you'll be on next week. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you next week. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Unbelievable. There is something though. I want to talk about I mean, it's, not on topic. It's not on to topic. Get, I need to get a more comfortable chair like you do. I'm, I've Dude, got you kind really of do. A, I've kind of got a bad yeah. 
jig up here. I need oh, to. This thing is this thing is awesome. I love I got this. this thing. I got this hardwood chair. I'm sitting here scrambling around, dropping pins. Now, see, that's 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 a saint right there. That's a man who is offering mortifying his flesh. Oh yeah, that's exactly it. what I was trying to do. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what, Jason? I've decided to let you back in the Catholic Church. You know what? For Lent, I'm pretty I magnanimous. We, I say we switch chairs for Lent. I'll see, I'll see you at <laughs> church next week. Um, thanks for joining Trad, man. That'll be it for our episode. No. Um, okay, so I do want to talk about something that was in the news a little bit. Now, this okay. is a little bit off topic, and uh, and this is this is something I am going to make some criticisms, but I'm not going to excommunicate anybody or say that you don't have to follow the Pope or your bishop. Did you hear about this story out of Arizona? All these baptisms for 25 years are not valid because the priest was saying, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he didn't know you have to say, I baptize you, because he's standing in persona Christi, and it's Christ who actually administers the sacraments through the ministry of the priest. How do you not? How do you not know? I, I mean, I guess there's really bad priestly formation, or what? And if <laughs> if that's the case, how many other priests are doing this that were in his seminary? I have to tell you, when I was going through confirmation, they would not have confirmed us if we would have not known that 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 when the priest is performing a sacrament. He is in. He is acting in persona Christi. So Christ is actually doing the sacrament through uh, the priest because he has valid orders. We would not have been able to be confirmed if we did not know that. And here you've got a priest who they went through seminary, was ordained to the priesthood, and doesn't know basic sacramental theology. Sacramental theology is so basic, anybody could. The I tell you. The average layperson probably has some grasp, but maybe not. I don't know. The average layperson doesn't even believe in the true presence anymore. But I can tell you, everybody at our parish would know this. What is going on in the seminary? And this is why I'm always like, you guys are walking around thinking that that 2000, what, 2004 sex abuse stuff, that that's all done and gone and we fixed it. Clearly not, because the seminaries, which is where you catch these perverts before they become a cancer on society, clearly hasn't been fixed. Clearly. Or maybe it has. I mean, this guy was ordained 25 years ago, so maybe hey, they fixed it since then. But Talking about seminaries, I saw this today from Father Chad Ripperger. One of the biggest challenges faced in seminaries today is finding students who don't watch anime. Are you serious? Yeah, apparently that was a quote by him that, that somebody posted. And you know what's t uh, really getting off topic here? So at, at my uh, at my son's, uh, my kids wrestling where they wrestle their gym, mm -hmm. they uh, right next door is an anime store, right? Uh, okay. We just moved a couple uh, uh, buildings down recently to get a bigger room. But for, for the longest, we were right next door to this anime store. So you know how your phone basically tracks you? And it knows about what time you're going to different places and it'll pop up on your phone. Sure. It'll say, hey, time to go here, 25 minute drive or whatever. <laughs> One day it said, hey, um, it's time to go to Paradise Anime. And I'm sitting here going, like, I'm like, I feel like I have to justify, my, justify myself to my phone. Like, I ain't going there. <laughs> so <laughs> anime, anime is, uh, it's, it's like j Japanese animation, but it's, it's, pornographic is that correct i mean i, I mean i guess that, i guess it can be i mean i guess they show the women very i got gotcha. you but it's not a plump i don't know because i know there's the some is. there's some shows out there that uh like i used to watch like uh i used to watch cowboy bebop and i used to watch uh speed racer that was like a when i think of japan anime i think of that and i from my understanding, when the people talk about anime, they're talking about something different. But I'm I might be wrong about that. Well, I I, I forgot who it might have been my wife or something. I know one day we were leaving because uh, you know I I have younger kids and one of them was you know they I guess they saw the cartoon drawings on the window or whatever. Which there's nothing immodest about what what they're having on their windows. But anyway, 
they asked if they could go in and they uh, their mother told them no it'd be inappropriate for us to go in there with some of those some of the things they i guess they draw or whatnot but honestly i don't know a whole lot about it but the 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 reason I I decided to read that quote was because going to what you're saying, apparently they have a lot of issues in, in, in seminary and it seems like at least in the social media world, it seems like a lot of priests are very immature in the sense that they're still like, at some point we have to grow up and be men, right? And I'm not saying that means that you're constantly just serious all the time, ready to, you know, ready to fight the next person they cross you or whatever, the, you know, yeah. be extra manly. Have fun, enjoy life, do all that. But there are some things where it's like when your life consists of these childish cartoons or toys or stuff like that sometimes it's time just to grow up be a man you know when i was younger i loved to play video games and I, every now and then i like to play video games i guess i mean i'm but still I have, a video game guy i mean not to the point where i was but that's what well, 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 well that, that's what i'm about to say like i used to play all the time in college when i was younger stuff like that i play every now and then but we got responsibilities you know I, right you know and on top of it i don't really do a whole lot of video games because I don't want my kids playing video games all the time either because, you know, screens, they got screen TV, phone, you know, well, my kids don't have phones, but, you know, your phones they're wanting to use or, or these video games or whatnot. But I think there comes a point when, when these childish things interfere with your intellectual maturity, especially as a man, because we, we do have an effeminate culture here in America. It's only getting worse you know, uh, uh, among men. I mean, it's it's time to put these, as Paul says, put these childish things away. Well, I I, I guess, I, so according to Wikipedia, which is the Wiki. of all truth and knowledge, um, anime, the just, anime just refers to general <clears throat> Japanese animation, not necessarily pornographic, but I, I do get your point that it is, it, it it's for young people. I mean, well, well, maybe some of it isn't, but it look it's cartoons, right? And I can tell you when I was I I went to a seminary. I spent two years as a novice in a house of formation. I was too young, quite frankly. I mean, I don't think that I, you know, now that I'm older, I should go back or anything. I I did not have a vocation to the priesthood, um, and I'm glad I gave God a first my first shot um, at that. But like I was too young, I, I really was. I, I was, I was eighteen when I entered the novitiate, and nineteen when I left. And that the the amount of, and I still got a lot of maturing to do. But the amount of maturing that I was able to do in the last twenty years, I mean, I can look back for sure and say, you know, one of the things I like about the priestly fraternity of Saint Peter is they don't typically take kids that young. You have to have a college degree. You have to have already completed your college degree and or otherwise have some life experience under your belt by the time you arrive in your mid-20s to early 30s for to begin your formation. I think that's prudent and that's and that's wise. Um, did, did you know Father Rock, Father Rock served in the Air Force and was like a... Uh, what kind of engineer is he? Um, anyway, he's. I think he has an engineering or some type of degree. Did you know that? I, I I didn't know Father Rock was in the Air Force. I know that Father. I've heard that Father Van Fleet was a, a helicopter mechanic at one time. Yeah, yeah. And, I think yeah, he was just that. civilian. I think he was just in the civilian um, world when he did that. And you know, um, I like. I I tell people be wary of. You know how there's okay, so Father Charles Van Fleet, who's the pastor over at Regina Chaley, the best. Um, <laughs> he is. He, he really is, but he's also oh, he, not somebody. So, sorry, he so doesn't Father, have. So, sorry, Father Rock. Sorry, Father Rock has an, a degree in aerospace engineering, and then it says he spent. Um, uh, let's see, he spent four years in the Air Force. So, kind of, I mean, it just goes back to what you were saying. It seems like the priestly fraternity, uh, the priestly fraternity, wants. Some so life experiences, Father, yeah. Father Van Fleet sometimes doesn't 
there, there might be some people who don't like the fact that he doesn't have a really big personality. He's not exactly soft spoken and he's not mean. He's just kind of serious and he he doesn't really put on airs to try to get you to like him. Um, I like that in a priest because let me tell you something. Be leery of that priest who's Father Joe Cool and goes out of his way to just tell the funniest jokes and, you know, he's laid back and casual and, hey, man, I'm cool like you, you know, and I'm always trying to fit in and come over for dinner and, you know, and hang out with – be leery of that guy because he's grooming you for something. Well, those are – okay, well, uh, maybe not the grooming part, but those are small examples of a bigger problem within the church itself that we've talked about, right? Trying to always fit in with the world and make people like you instead of just saying, hey, here's the truth, take it or leave it. And I'm also – and I don't think you – I don't think I have to – I think people automatically get this next one, which is these guys who are going around preaching the gospel of sexual license all the time. Without exception, so far in my experience, all those guys turn out to be creeps. Uh, There was a case in Boston. and I know everybody talks about James Martin and they can't wait to have him on the View, and they can't wait to you know put him on Time Magazine. Oh, he... by the way, the View invited us next week. Oh man, I Can won't be able to make them, it. You tell them no, not only no, but hell no. Um, oh, I'd go on. Uh, I mean, I'd, <laughs> I don't know what I don't know how I would look or what I would do, but hey, you know what? I'd Let be up here. I would just, at a minimum, it would get us some exposure. There was a priest in Boston during the during the 60s and 70s named pa- Father Paul Shanley. Father Paul Shanley went around and had exactly the same ministry James Martin does now. He was he was the cool priest <coughs> and he was the 1960s priest and he preached that we needed to start accepting people for uh the 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 sexual proclivities they have and and we need to throw out he actually wrote a pamphlet called the changing of sexual norms. Uh, he was at the conference where they founded NAMBLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association. Are you he was serious? at that conference. Oh. What and was his name? Father Paul Shanley. Shanley. And then, of course, in 2004, the Boston Globe publishes its famous Spotlight Report. And you'll never believe this. I mean, take a seat and, and grab and hold on. But it turns out Father Shanley was kind of a creep. I know. I know. Unbelievable, right? Uh, yeah, it turns out he was, out of all the the pederast priests in Boston, he was probably one of the worst ones. I'm just saying, these guys who were constantly walking around talking about, you know, change you you need to change your mind on on sexual morality and start being more open to the change of sexual norms i'm not saying i got dirt on james martin or anything like that i i don't want to slander anybody's name i'm just saying if it came out five or six years from now that he was a creep i wouldn't be like blown away i'd be like well he talked it's all he talked about constantly i mean well, hello well, it it says that this father Shanley, Paul yeah. Shanley, it mm-hmm. says that he was he was laicized and he was convicted of raping a child. That's so, what he was that's 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 the one he was convicted in a court of law for. But according to the records of the archdiocese, he had re- hundreds. Yeah, well, at least this one boy or this man, I guess when he was a boy, Accuse him of repeatedly doing it. Good gracious. Okay. I'm going to close that for. I mean, it's not something you want to read the details about, but when the guy was, you know, constantly preaching that, you know, you need to be more open about my sexuality and and the differences in sexuality and sex, 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 sex. Brace yourself for the thing, for the idea that he may be a pervert. Well, a lot of people have been making that same same type of argument for what happened in Germany with that German synod, you know, mm. how they're how they're promoting these things and 
I've read a lot of people say, why are, why are they doing that? Some people believe because they're trying to justify their lifestyle that they're already living. They just, they just need to be able to, I guess, feel better about themselves. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, well, it's look, I've known, uh, people who are, uh, homosexuals and for the most part, uh, they, they've been really great people. I can't think of it. You know, there, there's, there are some that were just like, I, I think they were saying they were gay so they could get up in your face about it and be the political activist type person. But there were a lot of people who, you know, um, that was their, their sexual orientation and that's, uh, how they lived and you if you wanted to be their friend that was cool if you didn't that's cool too they didn't demand that you changed your beliefs about sexual morality or that you just not have any um they knew that my religion uh, teaches that that is not a legitimate or morally licit use of the sexual faculty they know that uh, but for the most part you know like you said earlier it's it is possible to disagree and not hate the other person yeah. Whom you're disagreeing with, especially if you consider them a brother in Christ and you want them to repent. Um, but there's, there's something about people who talk about it constantly, and that's it's the only thing they want to talk about. It's the only subject. Or they of find it in any story. Like you're talking but, yeah. about, you're talking about like back in the day, Mark McGuire hitting a home run, and all of a sudden it turned you 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 push this agenda into it. it's like. Why are you, you know? Why are you even bringing this up? And I can't believe I brought up a Mark McGuire. I don't know what is he talking about the steroids thing or? No, no, no. I'm just talking about how you know people stories that don't have anything to do with sexuality. Oh yeah, yeah. they okay, input yeah. it in there. Work it in and yeah, yeah. And you know, it. I'm just saying that the the degree to. I understand you can that you have liberal Catholic priests in the in the in the Society of Jesus. I'm not shocked by that, right? It doesn't blow my mind. And I bet many of them believe that it's important that the Catholic Church change its teaching on homosexuality, even though from what we just read in Vatican I, that would be impossible. Um but they also talk about other things. You know, they talk about uh we have to crush capitalism and we, you know, you you know the their their different platforms, but it seems like James Martin doesn't have any other thing he wants to talk about. It, it, he he doesn't have any other um, concerns. He doesn't have any other issues. He just wants to talk about that all the time, and it kind of creeps me out a little bit. I I don't know. I, I like I said, I don't have dirt on the guy, and I'm not saying you should go looking for it, but. Just hey, just hey, watch hey. your your kids. Yeah. Just keep them close. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, heck, you may meet him and think, oh, he's a great person and, you know, like the enjoyable to be around in real life. But still, I mean, my, my experience with what you were talking about earlier with, with people with same-sex attraction is I've never really run across in my personal life people that are like these vehemently, you either agree with me or you're you're basically Hitler, right? Right. It's always been that, that same mutual res respect, you know, for, for the, for the humanity and the other person. Right. Right. Okay. They know I disagree. We many times in some of these situations, even, even with other topics, we've had these conversations and they, we disagree. They know that, Hey, I, I think what you're doing is, is sinful, but they haven't hated me for it. And I don't hate them because they are living that lifestyle. Now, would I like for them to leave it? Well, absolutely. But uh, but we can have these conversations. I mean, I, I think back about some of my really good friends through the years. I could think of a couple where we 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 used to argue sometimes. And there was once or twice. I, I know one instance with one of my really good friends. We almost came to blows one time. Guess what? Next day, like it never happened. So. Oh, I've seen I've, I've seen in my practice. In fact, I was in I was in court once waiting for my trial to start. The two the two lawyers who are up in front of me, um, they get into a very heated exchange over a piece of evidence that one lawyer wants to admit and the other lawyer wants to object to. 
the judge finally gets into the heat. These guys are having a very spirited discussion. They're not yelling, but they're having a very spirited discussion. And finally, the judge tells the the prosecutor. No, he told the defense attorney. I'm sorry. He told the, he told the defense attorney. If you say this, if you say this particular thing one more time, I will find you in contempt of court. And he said it. And the judge said, You're, I'm holding you in contempt 30 days. Bailiff, take him into custody. Bam. Half an hour later, I was done with my bench trial real quick. And uh, there was a bar across the street where it's kind of a famous place where lawyers and stuff will go after court. And all three of them were sitting in there having a drink together. It's just business. Yeah. You know? Um, and they're, they're, having, they're all having a beer in there and laughing about it. Uh, the, the lawyer never really went to jail. You get if you're an attorney, you get automatic uh, personal recognizance bond if you get found in contempt of court. Nice. So he, he never <laughs> he never actually went to jail. But you know the thing is is that and and going back to our conversation earlier about burning heretics, it is absolutely appropriate for you to have beliefs about sexual morality and. And the church absolutely has the authority to to define what those beliefs are. But it's never okay to physically assault uh, somebody who is homosexual. It's never, I mean, I mean, uh, unless you're defending yourself from them or something and you have to to get away from that. But yeah. for assaulting them yeah. or, 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 or yelling at them or saying, calling them horrible names uh or you know otherwise singling them out for some type of special punishment or ridicule or anything like that i don't think that's what christ would have wanted us to do well they and still I, have... and the church says, the church tells us not to do things like that exactly and they still have dignity as a person if sin causes us to lose our dignity then none of us have dignity absolutely and that's and that's the thing is to hate to, to quote unquote hate gay people or hate people for being gay uh, is really to hate yourself. You're in the same boat. Now, maybe you don't have that particular predilection, but I'm telling you, everybody's got a sex thing. Yeah. Well, everybody. Uh... And, you know, you have to spend your life. Our human sexuality is a gift from God, but it's also a victim of our fallen human nature. And we have to we have to spend our lives correcting the things about our nature that are fallen so that we can be saints. And that's and that's the whole point. It's not about hating anybody. And James Martin knows that. So it yeah. really irritates me when he's like, I wish the Catholic Church would stop hating gay people. It's like you are the most lioness. That is such a lie. And you ought to feel bad about that, but you're a sociopath, so you don't. I I shouldn't well, call him a sociopath. I don't know that he is or not, but we, we remember when we first started this podcast. I I told you that based on his tweets all the time, we ought to come up with a segment called Contra Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but li yeah. listen, li two things. Listening to your advice, I don't want people to start thinking that we're creeps and groomers. So maybe we should move on from the sexual sins. And get the... I'm just saying they haven't fixed the seminary yet. The baptism well, thing is. I was going to say let's. Going back to the baptism, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, that, which, by the way, I just found out because of this, that our Eastern uh, Catholic, they have a different formula for for the baptism. You know, they don't say, I baptize you. I believe they say, servant of God, Mark Robertson is baptized in the name of the Father, or something similar, right? But he, looking back at my baptism, because like I've said before, I, I didn't grow up catholic been catholic since 2018 but the faith group i grew up in was one of the few protestant groups that preached and taught that baptism was necessary for salvation if mm -hmm. forgave if you wanted forgiveness of your sins you needed to be baptized now they didn't believe in original sin and stuff like that so you usually weren't baptized till 12 if you grew up in the group 12 13 which age of consent is what you know they like to call it but anyway i i look back at mine and i can't think of a time where anybody was not baptized where whoever was baptizing you baptized you where they would say i baptize you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and they would 
immerse you and then bring you up. Right. So it was kind of interesting that one of the reasons the Catholic Church says I is because the priest is acting in persona Christe. But then it, 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 it kind of makes me think, well, how does all that work considering that anybody can baptize? I'm Now, th- this uh, this is a separate conversation from the priest saying we because I believe he, he was wrong in doing that. And I'm not, you know... That's not the no, reason yeah. I'm asking these questions. No, I'm just I, saying, I know what you're saying. How does that question? How does that work? You know, if anybody can baptize, the Catholic Church accepted my baptism because it was in the Trinitarian formula, you know, through immersion. Um, so if 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 the priest is acting in persona Christi, that's one of the reasons that that the church says he needs to say I. Right. Um, so, I, so how do they view I can, that from anybody I, else doing? Yeah, that, I, I guess I can actually tell you the answer to this. Um, so there, there are levels of, of priesthood. So think about it this way: in in reality, there really is only one priest in the Catholic Church, in the Christian Church, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the high priest. He's our high priest for, yeah. for eternity. Because if you if you think about it, in the ancient Israelite religion, which we would argue that we are the uh, the continuation of and fulfillment of the priesthood, of it, yeah. priesthood was not a vocation. It priesthood was a birthright. You had to be born into a priestly family. And when it came time for you to go to Jerusalem to serve your office in the temple, there was no, man, eh, mom, I'm actually thinking about going to medical school instead. Uh, uh-uh. no, you're, you're going to Jerusalem to fulfill your obligations. Um, Christ by virtue of his Davidic kingship is the eternal high priest now and forever, there will never be another one. And there will never be another sacrifice because his sacrifice atones for everything. Um, so if that's true, what are Father Van Fleet and Father Rock doing? Well, what they're doing is they are, by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders, participating in Jesus's priesthood. So that being said, there is a sense in which we as lay people enjoy some of this priesthood as well. And by virtue of our baptism, the indelible mark, our souls are conformed in a certain way to Christ where we do have some priestly uh, faculties. Like, for example, uh, uh, talking about the faith and teaching the truth on our podcast. That's that's, that's, That's a priestly function that the lay people can do and enjoy baptism is is the one sacrament that we can you know validly under certain circumstances uh administer then you have the presbyter father your average parish priest then you have the bishop the bishop oh you also have the deacons i forgot about diaconate now there's yeah. a diaconate the presbyterate and the episcopate the the bishop is the one level of the priesthood that in, that enjoys the fullness of Christ's priesthood they can administer all seven sacraments, um, but so that's so that would be the highest level. Cardinals, Pope, these are just offices. They don't you don't get an indelible mark on your soul when you become a cardinal or you become a pope, but you do when you become a bishop. When you become a bishop, you have a, your soul is conformed even more to Christ than than the presbyter, the diaconate, or the common priesthood that as lay people we enjoy. So that's basically. Yeah, well, answer. good point. Yeah, no, I, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, of course, I I knew they had the minister, ministerial priesthood, and then you also had the basically the priesthood of the believer, of the lay person, like because we're all priests by, like you said, by um, by our baptism. But anyway, no, I hadn't I hadn't considered that aspect of it because I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, you know, he's acting as a persona Christe, but anybody can baptize. But right. Um, that that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, I consider that. And uh, and uh, we're gonna do some shows. Maybe now's a good time to talk about some of the shows we got coming up. We're gonna do shows about the sacraments because the, the sacraments are something I feel very passionate about. Sacramental theology is kind of my uh, my, my my lay hobby. I, I certainly don't want to give you the impression that I'm an expert in sacramental theology, but it. To, to the degree as a lay person that I know anything about theology, it's the sacraments. It's my, my yeah. favorite subject. But we're also going to talk about some other topics. Um, Jace, tell them what we got coming up on March uh, 
middle of March. I don't know when the episode's going to post, but I know when we're going to record it. Yeah, so <clears throat> we reached out to um, Reason and Theology host Michael Lofton. Um, he has agreed to come on the show and talk about limbo. Um, it's not a subject that I know a whole lot about, something that I'm kind of studying up on. Very interesting topic, kind of fascinated by the whole the whole idea, you know, the differences in opinion. Um, so he's going to come on. He agreed to come on and basically talk to us about limbo. I know he wrote a book about it. Um, and kind of give can, us his, can we, can we excommunicate him? Do we have the authority to do that? No, but I'll he check. might, I'll, I'll he check might, canon law. He I'm, might be I'm able, sure. he might be able to excommunicate us because he has more, <laughs> more subscribers than we do. Oh, so, that's what it does. That's what, yeah, that's what the yeah. decider is. That's what it yeah. is. Okay. <laughs> you know, on, on a side note, uh, you know, I talked about how toxic Twitter can be. There's actually some really enjoyable people on there, you know, that, that kind of give you a laugh or something during the day. But somebody made a comment one day. They said, um, how many followers do you need to have on Twitter in order to have a podcast? And at the time, we had like 85 or something followers. Yeah. And I was like, well, the going rate right now is 85. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then it was yesterday or something where uh, somebody said, like oh uh you're supposed to have 900 followers or something before you have a podcast you know they were joking with me about it and i said i thought we had the discussion the other day but but the the rate's gone up it's now 95 because we you know we'd gotten more <laughs> more you more users or, or followers but anyway um so you know i i get a kick out of some of that but back to back to our march 12th recording yeah he's going to come on he's going to give us his viewpoint on it and the thing that i really like about this topic besides the topic itself is there's really no definitive teaching on it so we're all free to hold our opinion on what happens to to infants when they die with original sin sure. um so i i think it's going to be great because i don't uh necessarily know exactly what his viewpoint is i kind of have an idea for some articles and stuff i read i guess but i really want to get a hold of his book but at the end of the day even if i don't have the book i don't it's not like a debate topic where we're going to get on and we've got to be you know i'm gonna grill him it. i'm gonna yeah. grill him i'm gonna make him cry <laughs> it's not something that we gotta <laughs> we gotta really hammer home because me and you could all have or me you and him could have three different viewpoints nobody's right nobody's wrong so That'll be an enjoyable topic. Um, and I know... Well, a, a, there, there, well, there is... All three of us can be wrong, but if we all have different opinions, only one of us can be right. We just may not find out what that answer is until the end of time. Well, um, good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Because, because, like I said, the Catholic... Even the current catechism doesn't even def, uh, 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 define what happens, right? But anyway, I, I don't want to uh, get, ahead, get ahead here, but... Um, so I'm really excited about that. He was gracious enough to accept and come on. I mean, we're just a small little podcast with, with a handful of followers. So, um, if he, if he happens to listen to this, we appreciate him doing it. And um, this, and this is going to be, we're, we're going to be doing, uh, these shows on video so we can post them to YouTube. We definitely want you guys to comment because I, that's one of the things I like about YouTube is p people can engage with the, the podcast in the comment section. But the craziest comment will get read on the next week's show, just so you know. Because <laughs> when it comes to traditionalist Catholic YouTube comments, some of them are just gold. <laughs> I don't know how else to really say it, but some of them are really. But you, but but you know, you talk there. about you talk about sacramental theology. We're going to talk about talk about the sacraments. Great topic. I'm really excited. Like I said, about the one with Michael Lofton. But I'm also kind of, uh, well, not kind of, I am excited to, you know, talk about the seven ecumenical councils. I really yes. want to get into those. Maybe, maybe not necessarily, you, you're going to be broad in the theology of them, right? You, you study the now, because uh, right now I'm studying the Council of Nicaea. You're, you're just naturally going to be drawn into Trinitarian theology. It's a, it, you know, of course, it's it's great to get into, but I'm really looking forward to getting the talking about the history. And we're know, working what, on getting an expert, them. an historical yes. expert, to come and talk to us a little bit. It's not set in stone yet, so I don't want to talk about it and yeah. give up the 
the secret, but Drop uh, yeah. we're, Drop we're working on that. So yeah, so we'll have a really good guest with that, and I don't know we we have several good ideas. Like eventually, I know I've always wanted to try to get into the the crusades and what what we can learn from them today in our battle in the in the world in the church itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we can just pull all this together, I think we'll have some good things. I'm going to go ahead and sign up for Toastmasters or something similar. Um, to get <laughs> Don't change too much, man. Don't change too much. You, you know, you put too much, you put too much polish on it and it just doesn't sound like you anymore. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we I'm talked about change this yesterday. My, I'm going to change don't... the microphone because I mean, hiding back here, you can't, you, you barely see, which was fine when i was just on audio but now I, <laughs> now i've got to emerge from this disc and well see about you know better we talked yesterday i don't care where the microphone is because i don't even like listening to myself talk so i don't think i've listened to an episode since i don't episode listen to the two podcast or three. I, I don't no, listen i don't i don't listen to the podcast you crazy yeah because i because for one i'm very self-critical right like i judge like i'm a perfectionist by nature and everything i do and that's not a good thing a lot of times because it kind of holds you back or or whatever, right? So I don't like listening to it because I don't want to sit here and I overthink s- everything. Yeah, I hate the way I sound on the on the podcast and or yeah. just my recorded voice in general. And so I I as soon as I start as soon as I turn the podcast on, I'm like, oh boy, that's that's what the, our listeners have to listen to. Man, they yeah. must hate they must hate me. Listen, but nobody's ever said that to me, so I don't know, you know. Why well, I listen, that. I I know my flaws, and people have actually told me these things in the past. <laughs> the government says, "I know, I know, I mumble, I know I'm not clear, I know oh, sometimes man. my brain runs too fast, it comes out of my mouth, and I stutter." That's funny, you know, or I get stuck. I already know all these flaws. I don't need to listen to them and and pick up on them, you know. But but. Anyway, it's all joking aside. Just a little fraternal correction, my friend. Yeah. You know, we're... all all joking aside. I mean, this this podcast has been great so far because, like we said in the very beginning, even nobody listens. It's enjoyable to do. I've learned quite a bit since we started doing this about the different. We have topics. nine subscribers so far. You can't say nobody listens, and people in other countries are listening. Uh, Russia, United Kingdom, uh, Spain, France, well, Italy, we... Portugal. We came up that Pope Francis was probably the one listener in Italy. I think I, I yeah. don't think there's any other explanation. When I saw Italy show up, I was like, and it said one download. I was like, come on, we all well, know who that is. Some people you know? were blaming other podcasters for tra- tradition as custodes. It's it's us. It's yeah, us. It was us. Yeah, yeah. you're 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 welcome. All He's right? like, we need to get these guys off the air. <laughs> you can't stop this train. No one can stop this train. Uh, it's, it's either going to run great or it's going to be a fantastic wreck. I tell you what, man, doing this <laughs> podcast has been a lot of fun in, in a certain way because I I always want to talk about this stuff with my wife. And, man, it's got to get old after a while, constantly hearing your husband go on and on about Vatican II and choir lofts and <clears throat> other things. So. This is the podcast where I actually get to talk to my buddy and uh, talk about the things that I'm interested in. My my college degree is in my undergraduate degree is in religious studies and theology, and so that's uh, a passion of mine. But I feel like I don't. I can I can tell you when I talk and when I think about theology, it's not at expert graduate academic level. So I, I, I avoid that and askew that because I don't find it helpful. And uh, theology should not be about writing in such a way that everybody knows you know a lot of big words. And because they don't understand what you wrote, you must be way more sophisticated than they are and everything. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just don't have any need for that because it's not going to make, it's not going to help my soul. It's not going to make me grow in virtue. And it's not yeah. going to get me any sanctifying grace. And brother, I hoard sanctifying grace like a miser. So I want theology that's going to help me grow in my relationship with the Lord, um, make me help me grow in holiness. Yeah. Um, I like the early church fathers and stuff like that. So I'm really happy. I'm really excited. Our Easter show. You're going to want to tune in for that because I got something planned 
I got something planned for Easter, boys. Well, after our conversation last night, as much as you 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 have already done this, I'm thinking I might just be the interviewer and you be the interviewee. Hey, <laughs> I you know, and this guy, this Jason Mooney guy over here, this has been a he is a great guy to do a podcast with. I have had so much fun uh, these last couple of months, just our little back and forth and stuff like that. I don't care if anybody else doesn't like it or doesn't listen to it or thinks we're insane. We are insane. Okay. Well, well, and you and you have to be somewhat insane to expose yourself to the world that is in media like this, right? Because it it is not going to be kind once people if people start getting a hold of it. But at the end of the day, one of the things that 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 really attracted me when we we first started talking uh, about this, you know, Mark, I re- I remember I was out of town on, on business and Mark texted me. He's like, Hey man, we need to get together sometime, grab a beer or something, you know? And I'd asked him, I said, Hey, how's your podcast going? You got any episodes? Cause I was like, check some of them out. And he goes, no, it's not very fun to do it by yourself. You interested? And I was like, funny, you should say that. So it all started, but one of the things as we were talking that got me interested in that is the fact that we're, like you said, I mean, you have other podcasters out there who are highly intelligent, highly educated, and know way more than at least me, right? And we're just- and they've got too, slicker, they've got slicker production value yeah. and all that I stuff. Mean, yeah. I, I mean, we're just, we admit up front, we're two lay guys trying to figure it out as we go. We're going to- if this show goes on long enough, you'll probably be able to go back at some point as we mature and grow in our faith where we may even, uh, uh, in certain aspects, we may say, you know what? I disagree with what I thought about that, this, this topic back then, right? Because your maturity can, can do that. Um, but anyway, we're just two lay guys figuring out we're reading all these documents and writings and stuff that be honest, I may have never just read on my own. Um, and and we just get up here and we talk. Some things we say may be wrong. Some we may be right. If we're wrong, comment in the in the YouTube. Say, hey, dummy, <laughs> you're, you're you're wrong about this. Now, if you say, hey, dummy, I'm gonna assume you're talking to Mark, not me. But um, yeah, yeah, engage us. I mean, we are definitely open to fraternal correction if we're wrong. Now, dummy is my middle name. Now, if if somebody wants to engage us and tell us we're wrong, you're gonna need to engage us in the comments or in an email or whatever. Besides, hey, you're you're wrong about this. You're gonna need to explain to us why, because I'm not gonna just accept you're wrong. So engage. <laughs> Such us, a valid you know? argument, though. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that you know. Sometimes you're wrong. Is you know. I, listen, um, the the idea that if someone believe if, if if a man believes himself to be a woman, that makes him a woman, is just wrong. It's not true. Um, and you know, and you can put me out on whatever and i mean nobody listens to the podcast anyway so who cares but i mean if you you want to drag me and rake me over the coals because you need something to talk about this week on cnn that's fine but it doesn't make it any 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 less true there was a <laughs> there's a great uh story about galileo galilei you remember he was tried mm-hmm. for the heresy of believing something that was true it's a perfect example of when the catholic church was wrong about something and it still didn't, and it didn't cease to be the true church of Christ. But anyway, but it was also uh, something again going back. Wasn't to what a we're ma- yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with faith or morals. So yeah. it, that that particular charism isn't protected. But anyway, um, Galileo was walking out from his trial. They sentenced him to house arrest for the rest of his life, which is preferable to being burned at the stake. And on his way out the door, he looked over and he said, "It moves just the same." And what he's talking about is, you know, the, the, the heliocentric universe that the earth revolves around the sun. And he's he's got at his trial all the evidence that can only be explained by this idea that the earth is not the center of the universe. And they said, if, if you don't recant, we'll burn you. But if you do, we will we'll sentence you to house arrest. So he technically he recanted. But as he's walking out the door, he said, it still moves just the same. 
Where the hell was I going with that? I don't even know. Um, but I mean, I I've read things about that that you know. The, of course, there's always more to the story than than what the anti-Catholic media sometimes will say. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, Galileo was right about. Now I, I don't know, man. Like 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 I said, you go on social media. Some of these some of these extra super duper traditionalists. They get into all kinds of things. Of course, you know, you got flat earthers. I, I've never heard this before. Titanic w- never actually sank. Um, we ought to go back to um, monarchies and stuff like that. I don't know. I mean, would monarchy be a bad I've thing? I've heard that, too. I've heard I don't that, know. too. I, I, I mean, I guess a monarchy could be a good thing if it's in your favor, but is 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 the government we have now great? Them not days right, are right now, over. Especially. There ain't ever going to there. I mean, there's some monarchies left in the world. I guess the Catholic Church in, in Vatican City is still a monarchy. Um, but there's some still some absolute monarchy, some little vassal states out there that are absolute monarchies. But but I, there's nobody. I guess, no, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just to say there's nobody out there who's of any. There's no significant political movement that's monarchist yeah. anymore. I mean, so. Get I real. just, I mean, whether you want a monarchy or not, I, I really don't care to be to be quite frank with you. But it's like everybody's trying to out trad the next person. It's kind of like, oh, I it know. Kinda, it kind of reminds me of the whole like, um, not not talk about it again, but the whole sexuality movement and minor. Everybody is like trying to out minority the next person as far yeah. as sexuality or or whatever the case may be. And it seems like it seems like. People are doing the same thing sometimes in in the trad community. Like I am more trad than you because I grow these type of tomatoes, which are which are from fifteen hundred. Your tomatoes are more modern, right? I'm more trad, you know. And it's kind of like, guys, come on. Like Jason, I mean, I mean, we're I'm getting so, ridiculous. I'm so trad. I actually just reject the Christian religion altogether, and I just worship the pagan gods. That's how trad I am. I'm taking it old school. All right. I worship the Sumerian pantheon, uh, which is like, you know, 8,000 years old. So face, but, but you're still a monotheist. You're just, you're just super, super trad that somehow you come back around to it. It's that's right. That's right. I'm so, I, I got so trad, I became a polytheist and started worshiping the ancient Sumerian gods. It's kind of like it's it's kind of like uh, this article or this story I read one time about where they said uh, a trans woman and a trans man had a baby, okay. and it was the first. It, you know, a man had a baby is what it was about, and somebody made the comment. In some weird way, we have made a 360 degree turn back to heterosexuality it's just the man identified as a woman and the woman identified as a man so when they had a baby the woman had it that identified as a man and people were like oh man a man just had a baby and then one dude was like dude i don't know how we got here but somehow we got back to heterosexuality you know i and <laughs> I, I, I was joking with a friend of mine that, you know, vac- vaccines don't cause autism. <clears throat> Reading YouTube comments on traditionalist Catholic channels does. I mean, some of the most insane things and theories that said of vacantism is tame compared to some of the things that people theorize about it. That's what I'm saying. We're going to read the craziest comments. Well, um, and I know it seemed like we kind of picked on maybe the track community today because to be honest, that's what I interact with the most because when I start interacting with the other side, oh my goodness, it's it's 10 times worse. I, I can't even deal with it. Um, so if I'm, but, picking, you know, if I'm picking on the track community, it's not, it's not that I'm because, because I consider myself a traditionalist. Now, I guess some may not consider me. Some may consider me too trad. I don't know. But, uh, but overall, I mean, it, with all that said, overall, the track community, I think, is is really good. We've got a really good traditional community where we're at. Um, but anyway. it's gotten it's gotten toxic in some circles that have very loud platforms on mm-hmm. the Internet. But by and large, the the people that I have met 
in in our parish and in the, the <laughs> in the real you know, world in the real world are very wonderful people i mean yeah. are there exceptions you bet and they and, and all those people i think are wonderful are all sinners so they may not they're they're definitely not all wonderful all the time myself the first one yeah um i th- i do think francis has made a, a miscalculation here he's made a mistake i think he biffed it um does that mean that if i were the pope i would do so much of a better job let me tell you something. If they made me the Pope, I would have shipwrecked the mystical body of Christ on the second day, and I would have been de- I would have been deposed, and probably rightfully. I'd be that <laughs> I'd be that one Pope who everybody can agree is no, that guy, he's not the one. Um, yeah. But you know, I don't think there's any reason to be so scandalized now. You're thinking about leaving the church. You're thinking of you're going to go off and. Don't don't follow these guys into schism. That's not a good place to go. Yeah, and uh, it, it can it can have it will it will destroy you in the end. And leaving the Catholic Church is like is like deciding never to talk to a family member again. It is. I've never left the church, but I've been through periods where I I was so angry at the church I was just never going to practice anymore. I don't know if. If I've told you the joke about the Irishman who was stranded on a desert island, the first thing he does is he builds two Catholic churches. One he goes to every Sunday, and the other one he'll never set foot in again so long as he lives. Oh, I heard that one. <laughs> and it, it, it just goes to show you that, you know, amongst the Irish, there's this real, like, complicated relationship with the Catholic Church mm-hmm. that yeah, I don't really see in the Italians or the French, but in the Irish – Man, we will fight about religion, even if there ain't anybody in the room, we'll fight with ourselves about it. And um, I've been through those times where I just can't bring myself to be Catholic. And they were some of the most painful times in my life. I don't look back on them with, with good memories. And when I finally found my way back, a buddy of mine who was a subscriber to this channel, shout out to Kevin, We were in law school together, and he was thinking about becoming a Catholic. And I hadn't been practicing religion for years. I was I was a self declared atheist, and um, something happened where we would sit down, we'd start talking about Catholicism because I knew a lot about it, and it just got me interested back in it again. And I prayed the Rosary for probably the first time in fifteen years, maybe, and. We we signed him up to get to to join. He did join the church, and I was his I was his sponsor. So we went to his first meeting, and the deacon who was leading the meeting said, "Let's read a passage of scripture." And the passage that he read was about the two friends on their road to Emmaus. And I thought, "Wow," because that was that was us, two friends. I we were both headed out of Jerusalem because we were pretty sure, at least I was that. You know, this Jesus person ain't ain't who he's cracked up to be. And we just started talking. And the next thing you know, we recognize the Lord. It's a really beautiful story. And I, I, I just think, you know, guys, just calm down. Everything's going to be okay. Calmate. You know, as we say in Spanish, calmate. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, it's going to be, I, I've never been in that scenario that you're talking about for I me mean, for obvious reasons um <clears throat> but i just can't see myself at this point it, it, somebody's gonna be very hard pressed to convince me to leave the catholic church it's like i found my way here you know i came into the church in 2018 when there was even more of the sex abuse scandal going on sure sure and <clears throat> i always like to <clears throat> remind myself that when you look back at the Old Testament, you read about the Israelites, you read about a people, you read about a kingdom that was that was constantly struggling with sin. Wicked and evil men were at the top, right, at points. You had priests that were wicked and evil. You had uh, high priests. You had kings and all, you know, and all that stuff going on. And God, did God punish them? Yes. I mean, we read about the captivities. We read about, you know, the exiles and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, they never cease to be God's people. And that's how I view the Catholic Church. No matter how horrible 
people are like the whole McCarrick case, like you, you know, this, this Paul, Father Paul, whatever his last name, Shanley was no matter how wicked of people we have, even if, even if it's, it's, uh, Pope Alexander the sixth, God will, God will take care of everything. But at the end of the day, the Catholic church will still be Christ's bride. And I want to be a member of that church, no matter how wicked the men are at top, because at the end of the day, Christ is perfect and Christ is in control. And I definitely don't want to be off this, you know, be off the ship when he makes his return or I uh, die first. So, well, like, like we've said, I mean, for, for, it's not, it simply is not true that before 1962, the Catholic church was paradise on earth all the time. Yeah. There have been great moments in the history of the church. There have been, there have been popes who have been giants, but even those giant popes, I consider John Paul II to be a giant of a, I mean, he's just a giant of a man. Uh, I don't think the the papacy has ever seen anybody quite like that. Here you have a guy who is a brilliant theologian, and he's a charismatic media personality too. You, you don't get that very often. You either get usually get one or the other. Um, but for whatever reason, there was an abuse scandal that was looming under his papacy that he just would not or could not wrap his head around was a problem and he did not deal with it. That's a, that's going to be a blemish on his papacy, f you know, for a long time. Okay. Um, and the victims of, of those abuses have every right to be heard. And we need to come to grips with, with that story. We have to, we have got to confront it and not pretend it didn't happen. Um, so even the great popes will do things that will, confound the imagination. It's a difficult job. And for some reason, going all the way back to Peter himself, Christ seems to pick the guy who is seems to be least qualified for the job. I mean, Paul of Tarsus was an educated, theologically literate, sophisticated, cosmopolitan man. An incredibly charismatic and well and well versed, and I mean, obviously a very brilliant writer. Any any book that w would claim to contain the Western canon must start with Paul's letter to the Romans. I mean, to me, that is the foundational text of Western civilization. And yet, Christ doesn't choose him to be the first pope. Christ chooses Peter, the fisherman, who denied hung around, him three times. You ever hung around fishermen? Yeah. Fishermen are, you ever, there's, they're that saying, they cuss like a sailor. Guys who spend their life at sea are salty. They tend to be rough individuals. They tend to not, they tend to be uh, very plain spoken, shall we say. Well, and you um, can, re and it seems like from the accounts in the Gospels and, and in the New Testament, Peter was a little rough around the edges. He, you know, he jumps up, he cuts off the, the Roman, so, or the, the, the soldier's ear that came to arrest him, right? Right. Cuts off his ear. He's he's constantly talking about he's ready. He's ready to fight. Then what happens after Christ is arrested? He denies Christ three times. You know he's yeah. afraid. He's he's just he's not like you're saying. He's not this refined individual. You know he he it seems like he's kind of brash and he acts on emotion at times. Um. Oh yeah, I mean, but, before before Pentecost, for the most part, Peter only opens his mouth to change feet, um, and then after Pentecost, he receives feet. the Holy Ghost, and he, you know, totally different guy. That's just what, that's a, what that's what sanctifying grace does. I was a, it makes I us was, different yep. individuals. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. So let's focus on that. Let's let's you know when I'm when I get angry with the with the Catholic Church now, don't just ignore abuse and don't just no, ignore no. when they do something that is that is wrong obviously and and but in charity and and humility don't you i mean read fratelli tutti really read that go go i invite everybody watching this to really go read that encyclical and point out to me the thing that you're very that you're so very bothered by because when that encyclical came out, we were going through the coronavirus. We were going through the race riots. We were going through, quite quite frankly, people just weren't treating other people 
very well anymore. We had totally lost all respect for humanity that had all gone out the door. And I thought a document from the Pope reemphasizing that, hey, you are your brother's keeper. You do owe a duty to your fellow man to treat him with compassion and respect. It's okay to be upset about what happened to George Floyd. Anybody would be. You sit there and watch a guy get suffocated to death for eight and a half minutes. It is not okay to then use that as an excuse to deny other people's rights the way his rights were violated. Because more evil is not going to be the solution to our problem here. That's what Fratelli Tutti was about. I loved it. I thought it was one of the best things he's ever written. I'll have to read it. I haven't read it. Um, and everybody hated it because it came from Pope Francis. Yeah. Come on. Let's let's be honest here. And just, that's all. You know, and one of the things I've talked about on this podcast a lot is stop telling lies. Don't tell lies anymore. You know, and, and if there's really something in Fratelli Tutti that you, well, that's a heresy, point it out to me. I, 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 I'm interested in knowing. You know, I watched, I watched a video by two priests of the Society of St. Pius X, and their whole breakdown of it was, well, some of this could be interpreted in a way that's heretical. Well, doesn't that mean it can also be interpreted in a way that's just fine? Why would we want to choose to believe that he's a heretic and that he's a bad person? I kind of feel like as Catholics, sometimes we have a... I don't want to say duty, but maybe a, 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 <clears throat> a duty obligation or whatever. When we read these documents, to read them in charity and to <clears throat> not not try to, because I think e e even myself, sometimes we have a tendency to read into things that are not there, because we already That's true. Are, are, we are already predisposed to be against someone or something that we'll we'll read something that wasn't actually said or a viewpoint that. Like you said, like uh, you could potentially read heresy in that. Well, yeah, you could potentially read it, but at, at what mindset are you reading this? Are you reading it, reading it <clears throat> in a mindset of charity or a mindset of what I mentioned earlier, a hermeneutic of suspicion? And yeah, yeah and again, don't take things so personally. And if you've lost your, if you're one, of, if you're one of the, the Catholics out there who's lost your traditional Latin Mass because of what's happened, I, I get it. I'm angry too. I am angry about that, and that. Oh, absolutely! I, I, for for the life of me, I will never understand why the Catholic Church continues to undermine the Catholic Church, so that it can wax philosophical and lament about the constant undermining of the Catholic Church. I don't understand why they do that. Um, to me, it's evidence that this organization must be guided by the Holy Spirit, because otherwise, it simply would not exist anymore. Because it ain't run by the brain trust. Let's put it that way. Okay. It, and, you know, this this whole <clears throat> uh, bishop in Montana getting rid of the Latin mass because he, at least he claimed that he was getting phone calls and pressure from the Vatican. That type of stuff angers me, too. You know, because it's like, okay, you're getting pressure. I understand the politics of the game in a sense. But on the flip side, do what's right. Like... Don't just squash it because you're getting pressure, you know? Well, one of the, you know, and, and it's important to also look at what Traditionis Custodes doesn't say. It doesn't say, for example, that as a Catholic, you can't pray the Latin breviary, the, the, the 1962 breviary or the monastic breviary, which is what, which is what I pray. It doesn't say that you cannot, it, it put no restrictions on lay people's <laughs> right to attend the Latin Mass. Think about that. It did put, it did urge bishops to restrict the the furtherance of diocesan Latin Mass and which priests are that are going to be ordained that can say the Latin Mass, things like that. But all the restrictions were for bishops and priests. It didn't. And a single restriction in Traditionis Custodes says, "Oh yeah, and lay people should not be allowed to attend. Lay people can only go to one Latin Mass a month." And they can, it wasn't in there. Don't read it in there if it's not in there. Um, it also doesn't say that if you're somewhere where you have to attend a Novus Ordo Mise to fulfill your Sunday obligation, you can't come home directly after that and watch on YouTube or any of the other sources that's out there the, the, the beautiful liturgy that they do at St. John Cantius and that's televised. 
You know, and the Latin mass will be back one day. I guarantee you. They've been trying to kill this thing for 50 years. And again, oh, and if, there, there are no modernist success stories. So don't believe for a second that the gang that couldn't shoot straight for 50 years is now all of a sudden going to start working like a well-oiled machine. Come on. Well, and, Everything's going to be fine. And, you know, if, if for whatever reason you are just, you just can't stomach going to Novus Ordo, in most places you, at least in, in the ma near major cities and stuff, you have the option of um, the, the Eastern liturgies, um, you know. So this idea that while, while the Latin Mass is what, what I'm, call, I guess if you want to say called to attend, what I feel benefits my spiritual life the most out of the, the different liturgies, um, and we've talked about it before how how the liturgy catechizes and stuff like that not a not a fan of the way the Novus Ordo catechizes not a fan of the abuses that we that we seem to see on social media but don't discount the eastern liturgies because of that is i guess is what i'm getting at oh yeah no for sure because the the byzantine rites i mean i was talking and i was i was talking to a friend the other day and you're more than welcome as well but here pretty soon, I want to go to the Ukrainian uh, Catholic Church that we have we should here do in that. Houston, and <clears throat> depending on depending on how Russia reacts, maybe we'll go sooner in solidarity with Ukraine. But um, I mean, we've got like we've got that. We've got the Melkites, which I want to attend this year. That's we've a got beautiful the, liturgy. That's one of my favorite. The Melkite. You've uh, just liturgy is is so beautiful. You I mean, said you found you said you found the Assyrians. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's an there's a, an Assyrian Catholic <clears throat> church that's here. Uh, one of the things I like about the Melkite and the Assyrian and the the, the Middle Eastern uh, rites is, I mean, Christ was a Middle Eastern man. He lived in the Middle East, uh, and so there are certain aspects of that culture. So when you when you're watching the Melkite liturgy or the Assyrian uh, the liturgy, some of the time the consecrations are done in Aramaic, uh, like yeah. in the Maronite church. And so you're listening, not just to words that Christ said, <clears throat> you're listening to the very sounds yeah. <clears throat> that, that, that our Lord made with his mouth. Uh, and it's, it is so incredibly moving and so incredibly beautiful. Does that mean that the other liturgies, cause they're not in Aramaic are not valid? No, of course not. I mean, Again, <clears throat> don't read things into things that I, you know, haven't said, or, and don't read things that the Pope didn't say, uh, because and, you just know how he is. And come on. Well, and yeah, I, I, and that's the thing is don't 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 become so scandalized because they took away your they took away your Latin mass. You're justified in being upset, and being angry, like you said, we are too. Um, but but look at these other these other liturgies if you just can't stomach. But you know here in here in Houston, I actually controversial take here I guess is I actually think Father Felix at Annunciation does a pretty good Novus Ordo considering all things. G gather the firewood, get the kerosene. I found one. <laughs> I found but one. But you, you know, know what? I'm reinstating your excommunication. <laughs> it's done. But when you know when you go to Holy League, have you been to Holy League here in Houston? <clears throat> What is that? So <clears throat> once a month on a Wednesday, I haven't been in a while because COVID kind of shut the whole thing out, but I've heard they recently started it back up. So every or once a month on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. you'll go, I think it starts at 530 in the morning. There's an hour of confession and adoration. Then there's, then there's mass. And then afterwards across the street, there's a breakfast and Father Felix gives kind of a talk to all the men, like a topic. Okay. Is this is that annunciation. Yeah, and, it, and okay, it's just gotcha. it's just for men. <clears throat> um, now at mass, you'll have women and stuff there, but the 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 talk and everything afterwards is, and you're usually done by seven thirty, maybe eight. But uh, Father Felix does do a uh, the Novus Ordo, but he does it at Orientum. He you know he includes a Latin. There's beautiful sure. Bulgarian chant in that church during the mass. So he does a he he does a good job of it speaking. As do the thing. canons regular of Saint John Cantius in Chicago, and they they televise their their Novus Ordo says They're at Orientum. They're in Latin. They do have one in English, but even the English Novus Ordo is incredibly reverent and very very beautiful. So 
but but uh, but a lot of you may be in dioceses where going to the Novus Ordo Mise means nuns in pantsuits playing the guitar and eight year old girls twerking on the altar. I get it. I get it. Well, there, there there may be there may be a way to find a Novus Ordo Mise that's not quite so bad. Yeah, investigate that, but don't ever let the flame die on the missile of 1962. And there's a lot of ways you can still do that by <clears throat> watching the masses on YouTube and and because remember our Lord is everywhere all at once, and all believers who unite themselves to the sacrifice that's happening on the altar are present, right? So it, just like during COVID when they uh, allowed us to go to mass online, right? You may not be able to be physically present there to participate in the worship, but <clears throat> you can spiritually unite yourself to masses that are going on or even masses that have happened earlier in the day that you're watching on YouTube because our Lord lives in every moment to him is one moment. Yeah. And and our Lord is not uh, uh he's not limited by things like space and time. So you can still uh you know be involved in the movement, you can still start podcasts or come on this podcast and talk about the the missile of 1962, its history, its beauty, its 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 relevance in the world today. Just yeah. don't wander too far off the reservation because trust me, it's it's not pretty out there. And well, it's, and, it's a... and being a Christian isn't always you're not going to live in ideal situations all the time. Like you said, if if all you have are Novus Ordo masses to attend, fi by all means, do not attend one where there are these major liturgical abuses. I mean, right. I can see I can see how that can be damaging to your spiritual life without sure. a doubt. But I have a heart, but I have yet to be convinced I was just attending a run of the mill normal Novus Ordo mass is automatically because it's Novus Ordo damaging to your spiritual life. Right. Um, you, maybe, maybe I can be convinced of that, but I haven't heard a convincing argument for me. Um, you know, and, and anytime I've ever had to attend a Novus Ordo mass, things that I don't agree with, like I, I don't agree with having Eucharistic ministers, you know, handing out communion, right? Right, right. So when I go, I sit to where I know the priest is going to distribute communion, and I still receive on my knees, on my tongue, because that's what I am convicted to do, right? So you can still, even in that, you may have to make sacrifices. You may have to set aside s some of your wants and whatnot until time comes that maybe you get it again but just just attach those things to the cross give them up to christ no. sometimes you may have to swallow your pride too and do the best you can and at the end of the day i think jesus christ knows hey you did the best you could with maybe a bad situation and if you see these abuses i mean you've talked about it if you see abuses or you see something said wrong by all means talk to the priest afterwards say hey yeah, I didn't write, appreciate write your that. Bishop, write write the your bishop, write the bishop, write the CDW. And this is my point. Don't leave the Catholic Church because part of this is happening because every time the, the modernists take over an institution, we just retreat. We go away. We go find something else. This I'm not giving up. I will let them have the Catholic Church all to themselves to do whatever they want when I have a tag on my toe. I will never just give it to them. This is the listen. Government is a human institution. Sometimes the guy you want for president's going to win, and sometimes he ain't going to win. And sometimes, even when he does win, he's going to screw up and be a bad president. I never expected anything differently, and I don't really care that much because a day will come when this government, like all governments, doesn't exist anymore, and mm -hmm. something else will be in its place. But the Catholic Church. Is the, is the mystical bride of Christ, and it's not going anywhere. And I'm staying. I'm finishing my coffee. I'm staying. <laughs> yeah. for, any, for, any, for any of you guys out there who are fans of the Big Lebowski, you'll get the reference. Shout out to Kevin. Never seen it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a cult classic, and it's, oh. a, 
It's a pretty good. I it think it's like, a hilarious movie. But it seems like I always miss the cult classics. Like people are talking about this or that, and I'll say I've never seen it. Oh, that's a cult classic. Well, apparently, cult classics don't appeal to me. I guess I that's know. all right. I mean, you know, yeah. This is a Catholic podcast, and I don't know. Probably thinking about it, there. <clears throat> yeah, there's some you know damaging morals and stuff in it. Just like there are in all movies and everything. And I'm not saying that just because you consume a certain piece of art that you now have to imitate everything that's in the art. Yeah. Um, and some things that pass themselves off as art should not be consumed by anybody. But you know, you're you're all big boys. This show is meant for adults, so you know you know what what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> bottom line, hang in there. Don't, Don't get leave. too upset. Don't leave. Stick around. We're just stick. A, don't leave now. We're on the cusp of victory. Well, and and, and think about this. I think you mentioned it uh, on a previous episode. If what they want to do is push us all into out of traditional Latin masses into the Novus Order, look, at the end of the day, we could give them what they want. That doesn't mean you go there and you're silent. You know, I, I thought about this one day. I said, what if like, okay, so what if they shut it down here in Houston and we don't have a traditional Latin mass to go to? You know, I know there's talks about doing this or doing that or whatever. How would it work if we all just said, you know what? We all got together. We're going to all attend this church. And if we see the abuses, we're all, instead of having two or three letters, we're going to give them what they want. Here's, here's 100 letters. Here's 100 people make trying to make appointments with the priest to say, hey, this was not right. This is, you know, even e even though, you know, you may, you may disagree with me, this is not in the rubrics for what you're doing, even in the new Mise. I want to know what Susan's going to think when I join the parish council. <laughs> I know what she's going to say. She's going to go, won't these people just leave us alone? And I'm going to say, ma'am, we, we, were, we were leaving <laughs> you alone, but you wanted to journey together. Remember having fun yet? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I we can make their lives as miserable as they make ours. And in fact, our very existence seems to feed, be something that they find grotesque and incomprehensible. So don't go anywhere. You're driving them crazy. Here's the crazy thing is, is, is we say that, you know, half-heartedly, kind of joking around, but at the same time, serious with it as well. But here's the thing that, that just really baffles me in what you said about how they just really don't like the way we believe and the way we, you know, the way we um, go, you know, to the mass we go to and, and whatnot is – as as far as myself and people that I know personally that are part of the traditional community, nobody's ever really s said like you can't have that mass. I think we should get rid of that mass, and you shouldn't be able to do it no more. And you know what? You're less than me. I don't believe you're a good Catholic. So we've never, but they do that to us in mass, and it's like. Yeah. Do we? I said. I said in the last episode. Do we want the traditional Latin mass to become the norm again? I, I think it's safe to say, yeah, we do for many different reasons. But I'm not sitting here trying to say you're bad Catholic because you don't go to the traditional Latin mass. Because if I say that, then what am I saying to the Eastern brethren, the Eastern right. Catholics? Good point. I mean, bottom line, I don't know. I, the Holy Spirit is in charge of whether this mass becomes the norm again or the. I don't see any evidence that the Nova Sordo Mise is going anywhere anytime soon. And I, I, I trust to the church to direct her own liturgy. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I do that. But like you said, there's something hilarious about people who want to, who want to ban where you go to church and lock the doors of your church and force you to go to church where they go to church. And the reason they're going to do that is because you're intolerant. And we were well, leaving thing, them alone. Not, not, not like you, right? You're, you, you don't have that problem. That's only something for other people. And it's like, come on, man. But did, did I write a letter and publish it in L'Observatore Romano telling you you can't go to church? Yeah. I wonder. I always wonder why sign of unity is me going to one of their masses, <clears throat> but never them having to come to one of ours. Because it's not about unity. It's about showing you who's really in charge and making you subjugate yourself so that you know that you're lower than me, that I'm, I run the show and I can 
do anything I want to you with no reason at all. That's what that's about. That's wrong to do that to people. Um, And I'm going to tell you something. The Blaise Supiches of the world would love for you to go to the Orthodox Church. Get out of their hair. Go away. They don't this read the document. They don't want you here. Well, guess what that means? I'm staying. I'm staying. This is my house now, Kimasabi. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't join the church because Cardinal Supich wanted me. Yeah, you know? yeah. I could, I could care less if he wants me or not. Yeah, I'm I'm, um, I'm baptized, and uh, I don't care that he's. A, uh, I I, was, and, I I respect that he's a prince of the church. But his hostility to people like us and the and the general disdain that he seems the, the the outright disgust he seems to have for people who just want to pursue holiness and 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 be a, and be a Catholic, um, that's oh, his problem. That's his problem, not mine. Mark, I was just told last week on Twitter that you cannot that if I'm trying to attain and live a holy life, that I I I can't do it. Uh, with uh, acknowledging that Pope Francis is the Pope of the Catholic Church, just FYI. Wow. Wow. And you know, we talked about it earlier. We talked about how you know different groups and d- different ideologies of people. We'll see them on media. We'll see them, you know, uh, uh, just just uh, at, I guess in the mass media. I'm getting it, but anyway, we'll see them. And it seems like there's a great gulf between the two groups. But in real life. I don't think that gulf really exists as well, because in my experience, I know a lot of very, like I said, the the godparents to my children are go to Novus Ordo, but I but they believe in you know they believe in the real presence, they believe you know in baptism, they believe in what what the church teaches, right? And I and and also in my experience, them and and other people. When they come to the Latin Mass, or or they'll like I mentioned previously, they'll see uh, my wife and them veil and all that. They it, it, it's admiration. It's like oh that's that's beautiful. I love it. It's never oh you you traditionalist. You are such hate filled white supremacist. I only see that from 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 these the idiot journalists. Intellectual you know? the intellectual class of the Catholic Church. Yeah, the, yeah. Who never professors and the foot. experts who know yeah. so much more than you, and yet. And yet, when you hear them talk, they don't know the basics. They don't know that we don't baptize yeah. children. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, come on, man. I, I, I think you know. Again, I, they're, they're, they don't have a single success story that they can hang their hat on. And I'm often left to wonder if why they're writing all these stories about why it's not okay to disagree with Francis on this. And, and that's because and, everybody does. We're 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 not. He's not going to win this 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 war against the church's tradition. If if that is in fact what his goal is. Okay. Yeah. Again, I don't want to. Uh, there's a lot of things about the Vatican I don't know, and, and you don't know either. So, but if his goal is to stamp out the traditional Latin Mass and those who attend it, I don't see anything that suggests that the modernists know how to do anything uh that that they I mean, they haven't been successful at anything why are they going to be successful at this come on yeah it's the gang that couldn't shoot straight well it's, it's kind of one of those things where i think there's a lot more common ground among faithful attending catholics i'm not talking about your I two times a year catholics the ones right. that they're catholic in name only because they're italian or they're irish catholic or whatever and that's just what we do and right. you're faithful attending catholics i think there's a lot more common ground than than they would have you believe and and you know the the amazing thing is is that you know you you've mentioned before about tra- traditionalist custodians could backfire there's a lot of the 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 Catholic, just the normal run of the mill Catholics who go to your Novus Ordo parish, you know, faithfully and everything, they didn't even know this was an issue, you, you know, uh, as yeah. far as traditionalists go, and that and that uh, you I know, didn't know it was an issue either. But the way the the way the survey reads and you know was suppo- supposedly read and all that that was sent out, these people are actually looking at my experience that I'll talk to them, be like. I didn't know there was issue. And then they'll see what's happening with this after this dubia and all this coming out. And they're actually against 
what is happening to these traditional parishes. Like the, you know, these, these guys aren't hurting anybody. They're living out their faith the best they know how. And they're, and I know at Regina Chaley, we've had people visit basically saying, you know, we support you guys. You know, I, we used to do check-ins and stuff like that as well during during the COVID, during COVID deal as well. We had a lot of people come over because of things that were maybe going on at their parish, but then some of them were even coming over here recently in the sense of we don't see what the fuss is about. We wanted to come over and just basically visit. They weren't changing membership. They weren't coming here regularly. They just basically came over in a, in a show of support, right? Yep. And... uh I, I, I really think, I don't know if it'll backfire as much from the traditional side, but I really can see it backfiring from from just your regular run-of-the-mill mm-hmm. Catholic, you know? There is something I wanted to mention before we go. Um, there are some um, Mexican bishops who were arrested. Um, they were convicted. Mexican cardinals and bishops convicted for denouncing pro-abortion socialist government. Uh, among the convicted were Cardinal Archbishop of Mexico City, Carlos Aguilar Retes, and the former Archbishop of Guadalajara, Cardinal uh, Juan Sandoval Iniguez. These guys are stone-cold soldiers, man. That's what I'm talking about. Those guys are going to jail when, as cardinals... They, it probably would be very easy for them to just hobnob with the uh, elites of Mexican society and especially in the government. But they took a stand for Christ and they're willing to go to jail for it. So I think we ought to give some res- some some credit where some credit's due here and mad respect for these guys because uh, anybody who would do that, especially a- a- as a cardinal, when it's probably easier to just go along with what everybody wants to do and get along. I guarantee you James Martin may talk all his game about how much he stands in solidarity with, uh, with homosexuals, but I don't think he's ever served a day in jail for him. Yeah. Nor, Are they in jail right now? Like it, it like it's, current, I don't, right? I, I don't, I don't know. This happened back in December uh, of 2021. They were convicted. Um, so I don't know if they're, actually going to go to prison or not, but they have been convicted. And, well, um, well, if you don't mind, let's, uh, before we close out, let's give them a Hail Mary and an Ave Maria. Uh, uh, let's do three of them. You want to do three of them? That's perfect. You, uh, do, you, 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 do, you, do you know the I, Ave Maria in Latin? I do. You want to do the, you, you want to sure. do it all together? You want to split up first half, second half, what? Uh, first half, second half. I'll, I'll start and, and you can finish. Sound all right, good? go ahead. Uh, and so if you're uh, obviously if you're joining us, we invite you to to join with us in our closing prayer. We want to thank everybody for joining us and remember, um, you know, to keep keep tuning in to trad men. So in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Pray for us. Pray. Blessed Miguel Pro. Pray, Pray for, for us. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. That's it for this week. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God bless you. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. God bless.